My name is Sean Renee Miller. I represent the Waterloo Community Action Committee. I'm the secretary. I welcome you all here tonight. A um, few faces we would like to recognize real quick. Our local trustees from both Randolph and Atwater, thank you for attending. For those that don't know, please wave. You know, there are several faces. In addition, our Waterloo School Board is in attendance tonight. Thank you. On our panel, Janet Esposito, our Portage County Auditor. Uh, Mr. Eckland is on his way. I assume he's stuck in traffic. Representative Clyde. Mr. Harding from Department of Education. The Ohio Department of Education. The, the one and only. <laughs> and William Stauffer from Lakemore Schools. Uh, Springfield. Springfield, I'm sorry. In Lakemore, Ohio. I apologize. <laughs> Um, couple quick housekeepings tonight. We've created some questions for each of our participants tonight that we'll ask them. They'll elaborate on those. Should take us 20 minutes and then we'll open the floor to questions and answers. Um, we do have white paper up here. We can pass it through. If you don't want to speak, I'll ask the question for you. Um, other than that, are we ready? Can you give our answers to <laughs> No, no, no. I can smile pretty. Okay. Uh, first, Janet. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Can you please address our current property valuations for both Atwater and Randolph? 2012 was the reevaluation year of the total county. And they went down anywhere from three to six percent. In this area, it was like three to five percent. Some stayed the same, some went down, and some went up. Anywhere from a thousand dollars up to eight to twenty-five, unless somebody here had one higher than that. But it was a lot of fluctuation countywide. Remember, when you vote for school levy, the same amount of money comes <coughs> in for the life of that school levy. So you didn't lose any money on voting <coughs> levies. But if you notice my delinquent list that was in the paper, right, let's see, it was in right before and right after Christmas. That's only current year delinquencies, <coughs> and they are up. But the collection here is very good in the county. Now, soil prices have went up and tax bills will be going out in another week and you'll see variations in your in your agricultural property even with the reductions so how do be increases in cost for the taxpayer so that's all i have to say about the rebound taxes will be due february 25th and they should go out sometime next week but i don't have a date as of today thank you Representative Clyde, I'll skip to you. Um, should residents of Waterloo Local expect any additional funds coming from the state, thus eliminating our need for local support from our residents? Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me here this evening. Um, as many of you may know, uh, Waterloo was not part of my old house district, uh, but now uh, my house district covers Southern Portage County, and Waterloo is part of my district, and I'm uh, very pleased to, to be here with you, I, Senator. <laughs> good to see you. We're, good. We're just starting with our, our part here. Um, but anyway, I'm just very... Um, proud to, to represent you, to get to know your district uh, better, to, to be down here, hopefully to come to, to some events and, and get to work with uh, Andy and the school board and uh, be as supportive of, as I can of K-12 education in the Ohio House of Representatives. Uh, I think that you know, we're not sure yet uh, what is going to happen in, in the governor's upcoming two-year budget. And, you know, Senator Eklund may be able to shed some, some more light on this issue, but we should have a budget uh, that is introduced on February 4th for hearing, uh, and that budget will make its way through first the House and then the Senate, and then will need to be passed as required by the Ohio Constitution to be balanced and to be passed uh, by the end of June. Uh, the last two-year budget that we saw, uh, we saw cuts 
are made to K through 12 education. I was an outspoken opponent of those cuts. I think that we need to uh, do our work in the legislature to have a constitutional school funding system. Our funding system has been declared, as I'm sure you all know, unconstitutional four times uh, by the Ohio Supreme Court. And uh, we have not yet address that issue. Uh, there have been attempts made by different administrations. Uh, Governor Kasich rolled back uh, what uh, reforms uh, Governor Strickland had put in place, but put a temporary formula in for the last two-year budget cycle and made some cuts. Um, and you know we don't know yet uh, what will be out there. I don't anticipate that uh, the local need uh, would go away. And I'm not sure whether we'll see further cuts to K through 12 education. I certainly hope not. I will advocate against those. I think that funding education is, and working on education is my most critical job as a state legislator and our role in state government. And uh, it's a priority of mine, and I will continue to, to fight for, for fair funding for K through 12 education as a member of the legislature. Thank you. Senator Eflin, thank you for attending. <coughs> you heard your second traffic. Um, real quick, if you caught up on the question we're asking from the state perspective, should we expect additional funds in the near future and thus eliminating the need for our local support? Well, I thank you all for your patience. I meant no disrespect by being late. I, I just underestimated the time it took to get here from, from Chardon and then got behind a couple of uh, slow-moving vehicles on Route 44 on the way down. <laughs> Actually, I'm glad I did because I'm not quite sure I would have uh, paid as close attention to the state speed limits as, uh, as I was compelled to. But, <laughs> You know, God works in strange ways sometimes. So I apologize for being late. Um, you know, uh, I was appointed as a state senator back in November of 2011 to serve an uncompleted term uh, up in Geauga and Lake County. And then when the districts were redrawn, uh, it, it was made to include all of Portage County. So it is a, a singular pleasure to have been able over the course of the last year uh, to be out in Portage County and to get to meet many of the fine people who are here and who make Portage County their home. Uh, and what I have been struck by, frankly, is how, and, and contrary to what a lot of people might think, is how very similar, in many respects, uh, Portage County is to Geauga County, where I come from, and Lake County, which uh, is uh, the other part of the Senate District that I represent. Uh, and many, many of the same issues are shared by, by people in all three counties, and they also all share an abiding interest and desire to purposefully address those issues that they face on a local level. And that's very, very important to me, because I really believe that the people who are best able to come up with, to identify what the issues are, and to address them in a meaningful way, are the people who are most directly affected by those issues. And here in Portage County and here in the Waterloo School District, that means you folks. Uh, so I'm so very gratified to see such a, a nice turnout here uh, of people who are genuinely interested in seeing that these issues are addressed. Uh, on the subject directly of are we, can we reasonably expect additional money to come to the Waterloo School District or any other school district uh, to avoid some of these fiscal issues that, that you're currently facing. Uh, I have to tell you, I, I would not be optimistic, and I'm being as candid with you as I possibly can. I'm being candid with you because uh, what we have seen, at least since 1997, when the Supreme Court first declared our school funding system to be unconstitutional, what we have seen is an increase in the amount of money that comes from the general revenue fund, that is the state general revenue fund, to K through 12 education. It's gone from some $5 billion to something on the order of $8.7 billion this fiscal year. And we still have the issues that we have. So 
I think that uh, there is a strong reason to believe that there are a lot of people in the policy making position here who, who will look at that and say, we keep throwing money and throwing money and throwing money and still we have these issues. So that perhaps more money is not necessarily the answer. Uh, that having been said, uh, there's no question but that the state has a constitutional, if not a moral, and indeed a moral obligation uh, to provide for a thorough and, and, and efficient means of uh, K through 12 education for everybody in the state. And that's what we genuinely and earnestly are trying to, will be trying to do. Um, I think that uh, part of the issue to me is the extent to which we can engage people on the local level to stop necessarily focusing on things like how many dollars, how many dollars, how many dollars, but rather be thinking in terms of how are they spent and how efficiently are our school districts operating. Now I know the people, uh, the, the uh, school board here in Waterloo has been most diligent in uh, effectuating uh, spending cuts and being more efficient in terms of the number of dollars that they're, that they're spending. Uh, can they do better? I'm not in their seat, so I'm not in a position to say that. But I think that if the people of a community think hard and work with their local leaders to really get at the question of how can we operate this, this school district more efficiently, perhaps that's a better step than looking automatically to the state for just more money without really addressing the fundamental issues, which are the efficiency with which the operation runs. Um, I expect to be uh, at a meeting tomorrow night. Uh, there's a, a, a national group that has done a, some research across the state of Ohio on the functioning of our educational system, including the funding of it. I don't know, maybe uh, Representative Clyde will be there as well, but it's a, it's a kind of a joint uh, caucus of the legislature to hear this report, which I'm eager to hear what they have to say in terms of how we can be doing things better. And how can we be doing things more efficiently on the state level to make sure that the funds that are allocated are allocated where they need it? I share the representative's uh, uh, desire to do what's fair and what's efficient and what's effective. But I, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I would be pulling your leg if I was going to sit here and say that anyone could reasonably expect an increase over the next two years in the $8.7 billion that the state already spends from its general revenue fund on K-12 through education. And that does not include the billions of dollars that are spent and are going to continue to be spent on school reconstruction and, and facilities improvements programs, uh, all of which are, in fact, uh, continuing and we expect to continue as well. Uh, if, if you people have ideas about how to, to execute this process more efficiently and more effectively, I'm all ears and I want to hear them. Because the last thing I, it strikes me that, that any of you should want is for some guy from the state of Ohio, whether his name is Eklund or her name is Clyde or anybody else, to be telling you how to run your schools and how to fund them and how to uh, make the use of the money that you so hard work so hard for and pay in the way of real estate taxes to to fund your school so I'm all ears and, and eager to work with you to make for a fair efficient and effective system for uh, operating your schools and I pledge myself to, to doing so in every way I can thank you senator mr. Hardin um, real quick before we flip this over to him, I'd like to acknowledge in the audience tonight, Commissioner Chandler, thank you for attending. Mr. Hardin, based upon your analysis of the Waterloo Local School District five-year financial forecast, can you speak to when Waterloo would be looking at fiscal caution, watch, and emergency? Also, can you address what happens to a district in fiscal emergency? For those that did not, I'm sorry, there is a sheet on the table if you have one. Uh, thank you for inviting me up here again. Most, some of you may remember I was here about a year and a half ago doing a presentation for you. I'm not going to do that whole presentation tonight, but I will be here to try to help 
you understand something about school finance and about the, the situation that your district is in right now. My name is Roger Hardin. I am the Assistant Director of Finance Program Services for the Department of Education in Columbus, Ohio. And as such, we oversee or administer the Fiscal Oversight Program. Uh, fiscal Oversight Program is Fiscal Caution, Fiscal Watch, and Fiscal Emergency. First, I want to uh, say that I uh, um, hear the comments that were saying here by, by the Senator, and I think that all those are absolutely correct, and I feel the exact same way on, on those. Uh, that, you know, we're here to help you out. Uh, education in Ohio is a, is a partnership between the state level and uh, the local level. And, you know, as uh, we pointed out the last time we are here, the, the local level is going to determine quite a bit about how you're going to have what level of education you're going to have for your students. The basic uh, education level was there. If you want to go above and beyond that, which most uh, parents do, then, you know, it does fall upon the uh, local level. Um, I do want to talk, one of the first things that we do in, in, in our world is uh, everything starts with a five-year forecast. Five-year forecast looks like this. I believe most of you had a copy of it that is laying back here. And if you look at forecast uh, as often as, as I do, one of the first lines I always look at is line 6.010. And that's called the over-under line. That's about three-fourths of the way down there. Maybe you can point to that, someone can. Uh, and it's the over-under line, and that tells you if your district is spending above or below your, what your revenues are. Okay, so if your revenues are almost $10 million, which they are in this case, if your expenditures are above or below that. So if you see on that line 6010, a number in parentheses, that is a negative number. That means that the district is spending more than the revenue that they are taking in. And again, if you look at that line and you see seven out of eight years of negative numbers, uh, you know that the school district is, is spending more than they're taking in seven out of eight years. That's a sign for disaster, you know, somewhere. So the district needs to do something. What they can do is basically three things. You increase your revenue, you decrease your expenditures, or a combination of both. In most districts, uh, that do go into fiscal watch, fiscal caution, fiscal caution watch the emergency. They do a combination of, of both. They increase the revenue if they can. They decrease their expenditures. Mr. Stoff will tell you a little bit about what his district does. What we look at as far as declaring fiscal caution, uh, first of all, fiscal caution is uh, declared it, uh, under the jurisdiction of the Department of Education. If you get into fiscal watch and fiscal emergency, that is declared by the Auditor of State's office. Uh, ODE, we look at, and as a rule of thumb, we look at school districts that are showing a 2% deficit. If they're followed by a deficit later that's in the 10 to 15% range, which would be a range for fiscal emergency. Now, if you look at the forecast up here at the bottom line, you'll notice that in, in fiscal year 2015, which is a year and a half away, uh, your district is projecting a deficit of about $324,000. That's on the bottom line now. And that deficit is 3.27%. So again, a year and a half or two fiscal years from now, the district is projecting a deficit that would land them in fiscal caution. The year after that, their, de their uh, deficit of $1.4 million is roughly 14.7%. 14.7%. Now, uh, by statute, if it's a 15% deficit, the auditor state must declare the district an emergency. If it's anywhere from 10% on, the auditor state has some discretionary authority of declaring fiscal emergency. Uh, the chances are uh, fiscal emergency will be declared in fiscal year 16, uh, three years away from now, if nothing happens. Now, again, when I was here in September of 2011, about a year and a half, now, you're actually projecting at that time a deficit of 400 and some thousand dollars for this current fiscal year. I went back and checked my notes. And now you're showing a projection or a positive balance this year of around 900,000. Now that's a difference or a swing of about one and a half million, which tells me that your Board of Education, your administration has been working pretty hard as far as making some reductions or finding new money. And sometimes that new money comes in small chunks 
such as your pay to participate, additional fees, uh, computer fees, transportation things, that sort of thing, or they make most of it, excuse me, most of it comes in reduction of staff or personnel. So I can tell, I can look at the forecast and know that, you know, your, the district's revenue has dropped down about $350,000, and you'll see that uh, on your forecast too, up in line 107, which is your total revenue. Uh, your expenditures have also decreased quite a bit too, but they're still not to the point yet that's going to eliminate that deficit in fiscal year 15, two years away. So our office, um, again, we send letters out to districts. Uh, you got received a letter this year showing that you have a deficit and we're encouraging the, the district to continue to um, um, uh, develop a plan to eliminate that deficit in 2015. Uh, we will continue to monitor the situation here with them and hope for the best. Thank you. Mr. Stafford. <coughs> Can you please share your thoughts about the school emergency state takeover based upon your experience of leading a school district that was in it? Hi, I'm Bill Stauffer. I'm the superintendent of Springfield Local in Summit County. We're just about 20 minutes down the road, down 224, <coughs> going to the west. Uh, I've been there for six years. Uh, three years previous to that, I was at Rootstown, just up the road, going the other way. Uh, so I know what Portage County is like. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, like Senator Eklund said, it's uh, really great to see so many people come out on a cold Monday night to uh, listen about school funding of all things. Uh, I think one of the misconceptions that, that's out there, and I hear it from time to time, uh, if you have financial problems, just welcome the state in, have them take over the district because they'll so solve all the problems just like they did at Springfield. And on top of that, Springfield getting a new school. Let, let me tell you, it's not quite that simple. Uh, welcoming the state in to take over, uh, you do lose local control. Uh, at Springfield, our circumstances were much, much different than what they are here. Uh, when I got to Springfield, they had just gone into fiscal emergency. Uh, to be honest with you, we shouldn't have been in fiscal emergency. Our Board of Education at the time threw up their hands and said, let the state come in and take over because the community will then pass a levy. We, we pass a levy, we get new money, it solves all of our problems. Well, guess what? The state came in, the Board of Education tried to put a, an issue on the ballot for a levy, and the state said, no, you're not going on the ballot. Uh, we're going to solve this problem through cuts, or we're going to see how far we can get with cuts first before we ever go on the ballot. Uh, we were in fiscal emergency four and a half years. A uh, hundred cuts later, I, I added it up today, 101 people lost their jobs. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we solved our problems not with new money. We solved it because we were way, way overstaffed. We were able to cut over 100 people. Uh, we spend $6 million less a year than what we did six years ago, uh, which should tell you that Springfield Local, we were way overstaffed and we were overspending like crazy. From what I hear on this panel right here and talking to uh, your superintendent, uh, Andy, uh, that's not the case here. Uh, you don't want the state to come in and take over because you do lose local control. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure you'll have other questions later. Thanks for having me, though. Yes, Sean, can I, can I add a comment in there just off of it? Just for anybody that is wondering, somebody that's not here tonight that works for the Ohio Department of Education is a gentleman named Frank Hummel. Frank does staffing analysis. And we've done these on our own here too, but at our board meetings we show where we're at with compared to what they call state state minimum. State minimum is the minimum number of people you have to have employed as teachers based upon Ohio Revised Code. So you heard Mr. Stauffer here talk about them being able to cut over 100 people. Waterloo, after all the cuts that have been done here over time, the last few years of both of them and previous to that, we stand about seven, seven and a half positions is what they estimate. 
So we're not even sure when we heard Mr. Harden say that a year and a half from now we have a deficit of 314 or 25,000 is showing there. We're not even sure that we have enough to cut to be able to get back to zero at that point and stay above where the state requires us to be. So I just want to put that in some kind of context for you in relation to what you just heard with Springfield. We are nowhere near that level and that has been verified by the Ohio Department of Education. I would think the other <coughs> right thing thing is uh, being only, you say, six and a half staff members over with the new common core standards coming our way, with the third grade reading and guarantee coming our way, that's going to take more people to implement those things. Thank you. We'd like to open it up for questions at this time. Representative Clyde, you said that the, uh, it's been ruled unconstitutional four times that the funding is uh, wrong. What, at what point will they be forced to do something? Mary, I would think we were at that point, uh, to, to be honest. And I, I think that, and, and I, this is distrustful to me, and, and I believe that as well with Senator Eklund uh, from his remarks, but the politics in Columbus are, are very toxic uh, when it comes to public education. And I think that, you know, it's time for, there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, there's been, you know, big changes <laughs> implemented to the system with one administration and then another one comes in and changes it pretty dramatically. And then another one comes in and changes it again. Uh, you know, funding, goes up, it goes back down, as we saw in this uh, previous budget. Um, and, you know, I think it's time for us to, you know, to put a plan in place that can be counted on by, by our educators, by our school boards, uh, by our superintendents who have to forecast out, yet every two years we seem to kind of be changing the game and, and changing the funding model and the rules. Uh, and you know, putting more mandates out while at the same time often taking funds away. Uh, we need to be careful about doing that. Uh, and I think that you know we need to, to step up the plate and, and put a system in that takes some of the burden off of local property owners. That was the heart of the decisions by the Supreme Court saying that Ohio over relies on local <coughs> property owners uh, for their school funding model. And uh, you know, we've had attempts to try to shift that equation. Uh, Ohio lags where other states are in state support uh, for education. We rely, over rely on our local property owners, and some districts are hit especially hard. Uh, and you know, you know about your district and, and, and you know, the lack of business and sort of what some of the factors are that, that make it harder uh, for especially here for the residents and Atwater and Randolph. So, you know, I, I believe it's time. I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, our senator say that it, it's an issue that he wants to tackle. Um, I think that, you know, we probably have some different ideas about how to do that, but I think that uh, it's important for us to step up to the plate, get rid of this bridge formula, not a temporary plan, but a plan that, you know, our schools can rely on and it hopefully starts to tip the balance uh, away from that over-reliance on, on local property owners. I know it's frustrating, and it's the issue I hear about the most when I'm out there on the different communities I represent. And I went to a public school here in, in the county. Uh, at, at the time that the first decision came out, I was a, a high school senior. Uh, so it's been a long time that, that we've been fighting this issue, and, and I pledge to, to work on it as hard as I can. Yes. If, if, if I may, and, and uh, I, I think it's important for everybody to, to, to understand this aspect of the unconstitutionality of the funding system. The Supreme Court has said, and I'm not talking about morality, I'm not talking about right and wrong, I'm talking about constitutionality, okay? The Supreme Court has ruled that the system by which the state in Ohio, we combine state revenue and local property taxes to fund K through 12 education is 
constitutional. Okay, uh, one can can nip around the edges about how much of it should it be 50-50, should it be 50-59-30, you know what the percentage is. One can nip around at, but right now it's pretty close to 50-50. It's about nine billion dollars of local real estate taxes, about eight point six billion dollars in state funds out of the general revenue fund that go to K through 12 education. The Supreme Court has said that aspect of it, they're good with it, okay? So don't, don't, uh, uh, and, and I'm not suggesting again as a matter of morality or right or wrong or what is socially an acceptable situation that it's perfect. And I, and I agree with Representative Clyde <coughs> that we need to take a good hard look at that because I hear it uh, just as much as she does from folks about, and, and it's not, it's retired folks, it's veterans, it's people, you know, living in apartments and, and a lot, a lot of issues out there in terms of the use of the, the real estate tax to fund education. But don't, you, you should not reasonably anticipate that some uh, sweeping change is going to be made that says all of a sudden we're not going to use real estate taxes to fund K through 12 education. That is, that is far, far removed from any realm of possibility. If we, if we increased our income taxes to replace that real estate taxes, we would have to increase everybody's income tax in Ohio by 105%. You know, we could use a sales tax or a, a, a value added tax of some kind to replace the, the real estate tax. If we did that, we'd have to increase the sales tax across the state of Ohio by 113% for everybody. I've had people suggest to me that maybe what we ought to do is we ought to tax food in Ohio. You take the revenue from taxing groceries uh, to pay for education. Now, that's an idea, but I think people have to understand that the, the chances of us eliminating our reliance upon the real estate tax is, is not that likely, and it is, in that respect, anyway, a constitutional system. Way to run our schools more differently. Do you have or know of any efficient school models that we can emulate? Well, the question is do I know of any efficient school models that, that could be emulated here in Waterloo? You know, uh, offhand, I don't have one in my pocket here, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I can say, I'll tell you what, go on up to see how they do things in Sharp, and, and everything will be fine. And I say that largely in, in large respect because I don't know, and I don't know is oftentimes a good answer when you don't know. Uh, but more importantly is what's good for Atwater and Randolph may or may not be good for Chart or Geneva or Gallipolis for that matter. And I think this is where the local influence and the local structuring of things is so terribly important. I would urge your school board folks, if they haven't, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if they had, working in conjunction with the, the State Board of Education to go out there and answer that question. I think it's a great idea. We often do it in the legislature. You know, a problem comes up and we'll say, well, how do they do this in other states? Let's go see if we've got some examples we can follow. We do that all the time. And I would commend that as a, as a worthy project for purposes of, of the Waterloo School District. I don't have that silver bullet for you right here as we speak. I'm sorry. Further question I have, um, what is the Ohio Slush Fund and what is it used for? The Ohio Slush Fund, I think, I think you're referring to the Rainy Day, Day fund. fund. The Rainy Day Fund. Yeah. The Rainy Day Fund is basically <coughs> when revenues exceed expenses in the state of Ohio, those excesses are placed into a separate fund where they're allowed to accumulate. And at such time as they accumulate to a certain level, they automatically trigger income tax reductions for everybody in Ohio, which is, and I think the number is $1.3 billion. When $1.3 billion is accumulated in that fund, the, the law provides, well, okay, we've got enough money, we don't have to take quite so much from the people, and everybody gets an automatic income tax reduction. So there's no way that counties can tap into the rainy day fund for their school system? That would take an act of the legislature to change the terms on which the rainy day fund is in fact uh, accumulated. Now, folks, if, if you 
if you go out and, and ever had the opportunity to, to meet with a an insurance salesman or a financial planner helping you plan for your financial future they'll sit with you at the kitchen table and depending on who you're talking to they're going to say look you should have anywhere from one to six months worth of money stashed away for a rainy day and you know 1.3 billion is a lot of money but it isn't one to six months worth of operation for the state of Ohio. So it's, it's not as, as big a, a sum as, as you might <laughs> sometimes think. There is also, uh, there is a, a similar fund for um, I believe it's an education fund where if state revenues generated from things like the lottery uh, exceed the budgetary commitments that have been made to K through 12 education. Those funds are put aside for a rainier day, okay? And I've heard people say to me, have said to me over the course of the last year, actually we've got a, we've got a, a, a surplus in that fund. Let's suck that money out and, and dish it out to the school districts. Uh, but again, that money is there in the event that you know one day a. a fiscal year or six months is going to go by and we're going to have fewer revenues from the lottery than we need to meet our commitments to K through 12. So that's there to make sure that we meet the, the committed obligations that the state has over a period of time. So I'm not an advocate of dipping into those funds uh, for purposes of uh, providing short-term relief in the face of potentially long-term harm. I, if I may go back to your first question, you asked a little bit about <coughs> models, funding models, and things like that. Here's what we're noticing trends that a lot of school districts are doing these days. Uh, you've probably heard the concept shared services, and that is uh, 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 becoming very, very popular through a lot of different school districts. That's where they can share a treasurer. Two, one treasurer can share or work, be the treasurer for two or more districts. Uh, the same with superintendents. I think right uh, west of here at uh, Rittman and Warble, there is a, the, the prime model for that throughout the state. We do have other districts that are in fiscal uh, oversight, fiscal emergency in particular, that are doing that. Uh, do we require that? We don't require it, but we certainly direct districts to look at that as one of the uh, money-saving uh, ventures they can do. Because again, if you can, uh, share $34,000 in any of those positions, uh, that's half of the teacher. And again, we try to make sure that the teaching is, is first and foremost. Um, blended learning is another concept that you'll hear a little bit more about. It's, it's a trending issue that's coming on a little bit more and more. Blended learning is, in essence, is where you have uh, one teacher with a computer and uh, a, a, a program and teaching the same course in two or three different school districts at the same time. A lot of the students are now taking courses online in the school building themselves, which is a little bit of uh, uh, a cost savings, you know, when you don't have, the particular in a lot of areas in Southeast Ohio where they don't have a lot of, of the uh, certified teachers or the staff that they need. For example, uh, my daughter went to a small school down in, in Fairfield County, and she took uh, calculus from Ohio State University on the computer in our school building in the library. That's, an, that's one of the early examples of blended learning. But it's becoming more and more um, as, as a means of efficiency you know, throughout the states now. So there, you are seeing a lot of things uh, very similar to those. I just want to interject that as well. Thank you. And I just want to add in really quick on, on the rainy day fund issue. I, I think the concern is in, in communities like Waterloo that have made so many cuts and um, you know that it is raining in communities across Ohio that have seen uh, cuts to their, their K through 12 budgets, you know, despite having shrunk down uh, to state minimum levels of staffing uh, and, and the state is starting to build a surplus and our revenue situation has improved uh, rather dramatically uh, from the last budget cycle we were in where we made these cuts to K-12 education to the one that we're, we're about to embark on uh, next month. So I think that uh, there are certainly uh, people around the state talking about, well, can we tap into those funds? And I think that that's a policy choice 
uh, that the governor and the legislature could make. I don't think that the only choice out there is to raise your income taxes or uh, to put a tax on food uh, to fund education. One of the choices that's been discussed a lot is to uh, put Ohio's severance tax or our tax on the oil and gas uh, companies that are coming into our state and benefiting from our natural resources and making that tax competitive with other states to try to raise some revenue, uh, not to make our, our severance tax system the, the most stringent in the country, but to put us not at the, the least taxing state, or I think we're the bottom three uh, in the country. And that would be a way, for example, that we could raise revenue from an industry that's doing very well and that is coming in from out of state and getting <coughs> our resources and potentially uh, put that money towards education. So there are revenue options out there. It's up to us as legislators whether, uh, you know, what our priorities are um, and, you know, is education our priority and are we willing to, to do some of these uh, measures to find that additional revenue plus the budget scenario is better than it was two years ago. So uh, while I'm not saying, you know, there's a debate right now. Governor Kasich has said he would like to raise that severance tax, but rather than put that money to local communities or to K through 12 education, he wants to do an additional uh, income tax cut, uh, which, you know, that's a policy choice. So I think that there are options out there for, for revenue, but uh, it kind of depends on, on where you stand on them. But I think that uh, we need to prioritize uh, for K through 12 funding. Yes, sir. Mr. Hardin, can you sort of talk us through the apocalyptic scenario, if you will? I mean, Mr. Stoffer talked about how the, their problems were resolved through cuts, and it seems to me from, from looking at the budget and talking to Mr. Hill that there isn't a lot of room for that here. So let's just say that cut what you will, get down to state minimums, there's still the funding gap, levies don't pass. What's the end scenario? Okay. Um, the question is kind of what is the scenario or what generally happens with districts as they go into emergency as they continue to, to spiral downwards. And, you know, again, we have some experience with this since the law has been approved in 1996 for fiscal emergency. There have been 38 districts now that have gone into fiscal emergency. We have six districts in emergency today, uh, which means it's something that our process works a little bit. And maybe Bill could back me up on that one, uh, since he was one of those 38 districts. Um, the, about five years ago, one thing that we saw were the districts, you know, such as uh, Springfield and Summit County, were not doing a lot of the things that school districts are doing today. In other words, they were not making those reductions. You heard him say how the, the amount of reductions that they made in their school district once they went into fiscal emergency. That is not going to happen here in Waterloo because those reductions have already been made. You've made about $2 million, from what I can tell, in the last two years. And if our um, fiscal uh, area coordinator, uh, Frank Hummel, says that you have six and a half more uh, staff members to go before you're at the absolute minimum operating standard level, uh, you're, you might have another 200 and a quarter or so, $225,000 in reductions. Now, here's, here's the way this kind of happens here in Ohio. First of all, every school district out there has a charter with the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education sets some parameters. They set the curricular uh, standards. They set the minimum operating standards, which is a host of uh, quite a few different things about what a school district must do so that all the school districts in the state are similar enough or comparable enough to one another so that all the students graduating should be somewhat comparable to if they're in Northeast Ohio, Southwest, et cetera. The district, on the other hand, has to meet all those standards. Now, what we found out was that several districts that have gone into emergency, we've had to direct them, uh, the commission that comes in to oversee a district in fiscal emergency has had to direct the Board of Education and Administration to go to minimum operating standard level. Now, in several cases, that means they had to add a couple of staff members because they were already below the standard level that they had to meet. And again, the school district has to meet all those minimum operating standard levels. So the commission will direct them to go down to that minimum level, 
and then they will direct them to stay there because they have to meet those in order to maintain that charter that they have with the State Board of Education. And which means that they have to continue borrowing money, or actually not borrowing money, it's getting an advance of their state foundation money through the Solvency Assistance Fund. It is receiving advances year after year, in most cases escalating that each year in order to pay their bills at the end of the year. Okay? So we've had districts that go in, and the first year they've had to uh, get an advance of a million dollars, the second year two million dollars, the third year, well, the Youngstown City, for example, had to go 15 million one year, 10 million, then three million. And then finally, you know, by the time they made all their reductions and even passed new levy, they were to the point where they didn't need to again. Most of the other districts have done that. You, um, we did it twice. You did. You had to get solvency assistance twice in order to meet their financial obligations. So then they not only have to worry about their their budget, but how the money that they're going to have to pay back for the next two years. So again, we have to, we request districts to make sure that they meet the minimum operating standard level, make sure that they continue getting advance of solvency assistance year after year to, so they can meet their financial obligations, something about paying employees and paying their vendors for the goods. And uh, that will continue until they get a, a levy approved, which will do this. Now some districts, uh, Little Miami for example, started out asking the seven and a half mills. Uh, 10 levy campaigns later, they end up approving 13.95 mills, which means it kept escalating because the amount of deficit that they had continued to accrue continue to escalate and at the point where they did that they were 11 and a half million dollars in, in, in deficit. I hope I answered your question. I well, the, the, on occasion. the one thing you didn't answer is what happens if no levy is ever passed? I, mean, um, I don't know if that's ever happened. Or, or it's never happened. Okay. Uh, the only thing I can say is that all the taxpayers within that district you have you're still have a bill. The, the, the deficit uh, and none of the districts have gone in has ever been forgiven. There's nowhere in statute that allows us or even the legislature to forgive a loan or to forgive that deficit. So that deficit is going to be paid by the taxpayers of that district one way or the other sooner or later. Yes, why does the school board allow to overspend the revenue? And is that legal for them to do that? And who is responsible for controlling that? Mr. Arden, I think that that was your first comment. That was going to be my question. That would be back your to me. first comment was overspend. we overspent. And then later, much later, you said we cut. And I think everyone, when you said overspend, they just stopped listening. So. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't let us overspend because we have to do a five-year forecast. And in that five-year forecast, we can't say we're going to overspend. So you, but you it ends up being we got cut by the state, so our spending was more than our rent. Well, keep, keep a couple things in mind here. A district can't overspend uh, as long as they have some money in the background to pay for it. Now, when you started overspending several years ago, you had to carry over balance of it was upwards of uh, you know 400,000, 900,000, this year 942. If you have a positive balance at the end of the year, it's no different from your savings account to your checking account. If I have money in a, in a savings account, I can overspend my checking account because I can, you know, can transfer money over. My savings will continue to go down. Where we become involved, when we start the dialogue, when we start uh, sending letters out to the district, is when we see that you're having a deficit, that at the end of the year, you know, you, at the end of the year now you have a deficit. And again, keep in mind what I said earlier about fiscal emergency. You are required to spend money to maintain those operating standards. In other words, the operating standards, you have to have so many credits to graduate high school. I believe that number is 20. You have to offer at least one foreign language. You have to uh, have so many, um, what's called ESP or ex, help me understand this, service personnel, educational service personnel in the elementary. You have to have so many counselors, so many uh, music people, et cetera. 
And so those are part of what some of the standards are. Um, well, we allow you to, if you go to fiscal emergency, we do have to allow you to overspend because that's what, where the solvency assistance comes in. But you have to be in fiscal emergency in order to access that solvency assistance. What we try to do is prevent fiscal emergency for the district. So we come out and we do presentations like this. We send you letters two years in advance saying we see you're, you're having a deficit two years from now. You need to develop a plan to eliminate that deficit now. Um, again, as the Senator said earlier, they don't have any, it's a local control issue. Uh, the, the legislature doesn't have any authority to tell you how and where to spend your money. The Department of Education doesn't tell you how and where to spend your money. Uh, we can tell you when you're getting to the point where, you know, we're going to get involved and place you into a, a fiscal oversight category. And then we can tell you what the laws will be for that. Eventually, if you go to an emergency, we can say, kind of start directing and taking over a little bit of that local control that you're going to lose. When you lose the local control, um, they didn't come in and tell us, you need to cut X amount of teachers. But they did come in and tell me, you need to cut $500,000 in two weeks. Um, that led to us closing an elementary school. Uh, it wasn't a popular decision. It's something that we had to do in the, in the end. It was a great decision because that's what needed to be done. Uh, Springfield actually has been in fiscal emergency twice. Uh, we lead the state in that category. Uh, not something to be proud of. Uh, the first time, though, they went in fiscal emergency, immediately passed a levy and came out. So that was the thinking the second time when I said the board threw up their hands and said, let's go in fiscal emergency. The assumption was, was that a levy would pass. Um, but like I said, the state didn't allow us to put a levy on the ballot. Um, one of the other misconceptions, I think, is when the state comes in and they take control, uh, that they can take care of negotiated agreements with teachers and everybody else. Those are still in force. Um, we can't say, you know what, we're in fiscal emergency, so every teacher's going to take a $5,000 pay cut. That doesn't happen. Uh, you have a negotiated agreement that you have to live by um, in order to get reductions. And we got some reductions with insurances with our teachers, and it really helped the situation we had, but it has to be negotiated. Uh, that's not always an easy thing. So thinking that the state's going to come in and those negotiated agreements are going to go away and you can pay people whatever you want to, that's not going to happen. Those negotiated agreements, are they through the union or who? Uh, they are through the union. In the back. Yes, I wonder if any of you have any data on districts that are in fiscal emergency or have been in fiscal emergency. How do they perform on their state report cards? Springfield, uh, excellent four out of the last five years. When you're in fiscal emergency. We were excellent when we were in fiscal emergency. That's good to know. Do we know of any and, of the other And this is something that I don't have an answer to. I can tell you what I see happening. Most of the time, uh, or, or many times, it goes up. You know, the, 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 the scoring of the districts go up. And why does that happen? I, don't, I can't give you a clue. I don't know. I, I'm just wondering whether or not everybody's thinking, oh darn, I better do a better job or my job's on the line. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if that's the situation. But, you know, we don't see a lot of decrease in academic scores or academic um, uh, levels once the district goes into the oversight. As a follow-up, could that be because maybe they've made so many cuts? I know here in our district at this point, and like you say, everyone is working, you know, so much harder that in some of these districts they've already made some of the cuts before they even get to the fiscal emergency. So they've realized they've had to work at that level. I just wondered what the data was. That could was. be, and, and again, your guess would be as good as mine on that. I, 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 I just see this, and it kind of floors me because one would assume the exact opposite. But, you know, in, in Bill's case, teacher did a fantastic job. Little Miami, where they were at absolute minimum standards, and they even had the library, the books were all uh, shrink wrapped even, you know, because they didn't have a library. Their scores were right there, too. Excellent, excellent with distinction, I think, last year. What I can tell you, one of the things that happened besides the academic scores, uh, when we went into fiscal emergency, we lost enrollment. Kids left the district uh, by the hundreds. 
the so-called good families, they took their kids and they left. And when those kids leave and go to other districts, and you can do that via open enrollment and not have to move anymore, uh, when those kids leave, they don't come back uh, because they establish themselves in other schools and they leave. Every kid who leaves via open enrollment, Roger, is $5,800 that you lose, $5,800 out the door. So a, a bad problem becomes even worse. It just compounds. Uh, now that we're out of fiscal emergency, we're starting to see some kids come back to the district. Our enrollment actually went up this year by about 100. Um, but when you're in fiscal emergency, the perception out there is Springfield, that's a terrible district because they're in fiscal emergency. But we're not a terrible district. We still had great kids and we had great teachers. But that's the perception. It leads to, to low staff morale. It leads to a lack of community pride, I believe. We have lots of people who leave. And it just makes the problem all that, all that worse, uh, much worse. <coughs> Yes, 1965, I was a senior graduated from Randolph. State came in. I went to the service, and when I came back, we was consolidated with Randolph and that one. For what reason? It was money problems, or we were too small of a school district. All the meetings that I've attended here, the, the thing was behind the thing, state, and federal government mandates no child left behind. The new thing came out this year, the reading program. And from what I got from our board members, they don't send along money to run the programs. The school system has to find ways of doing this. If I was a senior graduating right now, to go to college to get a degree, $100,000. I could come to Waterloo and start at $32,000 starting. I'll probably never ever pay my loan back. I would, there are a lot of kids now, they don't want to get an education. And we're losing here at Waterloo <coughs> fine educators. But I see what you said about we overspent in the years past. We had it too good. Is that true? Let me, let me. Let me try to back up and clarify that. I'm, I'm showing what is on your forecast. Your forecast is showing that your expenditures were greater than your revenue stream. Okay, now does that mean things were real good? I, no, not necessarily. Um, other districts, have, and probably it wasn't that much. The one year is only 200,000. You know, uh, other districts have overspent millions of dollars, three million. I don't know that they had it good, but you know somehow it still happened. Um, uh, and you did bring up a couple good points about some of the mandates, and you know we're trying to face this with districts and oversight too, because we're trying to say, well, you know, if, if you meet uh, again the operating standard is 25 to one student to uh, student to, to staff ratio. So if you have a thousand students in regular education, you should have 40 teachers. Now we're trying to decide, well, do some of those 40 teachers, should we put more of them in the K through three area because that's, you know, the because of the third grade reading guarantee and have higher numbers in, in middle school and high school. And that's what some districts are doing in order to try to get around that. We have approximately 1,200 in the school district. You said 1,000 students. With For every 1,000 regular education students, and I'm not looking at Waterloo, I'm just looking at every district. For every 1,000, a 25 to 1 student-teacher ratio would be 40 teachers. Okay. How many kids do you think it's in a classroom with these circumstances today, with the kids where we have, how many, how many kids would you want in a classroom to teach efficiently? I mean, would I want in there teaching? And I've, I've taught in classrooms like that. Uh, you know, the answer to that, once you get to 25 even and above that, you know, you lose so much education for each of those individual students. Now, again, I can go back and look at some data here from two years ago, uh, and only because I don't have it updated, uh, but your student-teacher ratio then was 17.6, and that was in fiscal year 11. 17.6, so that means for every 17.6 students, 
regular ed student, now we're not talking special education, we're talking regular ed, you had one teacher, one staff member for every 17.6, which was the same as what they have in Springfield, by the way, and uh, the same as what they have in, in Marlington, but below what they have in Southeastern, uh, Southeast local Portage County, and what they have, 15.6 uh, was county-wide average, 16.5, uh, and actually 15.8 was the statewide average. So they're above that number already, which means that their staff levels are already lower than what they are at statewide level, what they are at county level, what they are with all of the, the, the other comparable districts that they're compared with on their local report card. Again, that was from fiscal year 11. Uh, uh, we've had some computer glitches. I don't have it for 12 yet. I have. Have you guys, any of you actually, have you studied the rest of the states in the United States of America to see how they fund their schools? And if you have, and you know the answer to that, who's doing it the best to make it as equal for all the students in that state as possible? The answer to your question is no. We, I've not studied that. And the reason for that is because in, in our case, we do what the, the legislature has, what the, they put forth to us. Um, and we work with them to try to manage that. Uh, I think that you mentioned earlier that you do talk with other, other states, find out other ways of doing it. So I think that question might be better related to them. We have to, unfortunately, have to hold districts in compliance with the law, okay, regardless of what that is. Okay, so then my question regards to that. Shouldn't there be a study done to see who does it the most efficient and the most fairly so we don't have to reinvent the wheel? And if you mentioned food, Maryland does tax food, and they don't have any problem at all. They, everything is smooth and pretty even right across the state. I think that really needs to be looked at because there's a definite inequity between all the states in the United States and the way they do things, and I'm sure some states do it better than others. You're right. <laughs> it, it, there should be a fulsome study, and I have not seen it, okay? And I have looked for it, and I have not seen it done anywhere by anyone. Uh, and I'm hopeful this process that we're starting tomorrow down in Columbus with this group who started that research project will have something to say to us about that. But I, I caution you all, just as I would suggest to you, that's what's best for Waterloo School District is not necessarily best for Geneva or Chardon or Gallipolis. What works smooth as silk in Maryland may or may not be what's suitable for the state of Ohio. And it, what works in uh, North Dakota may or may not work in even South Dakota. So, you know, it's important, I agree with you, it's important to have that information base and I very much hope that we'll be able to get that through this budget process. Uh, but ultimately, slicing that and dicing that and determining, you know, what you can import into the state of Ohio and what's going to play in Peoria is sometimes a little bit more of a dicey proposition than just a wholesale importation. But I, I you're absolutely right. I agree. With you. I have one in the back. My question is, is something going to be done? Another study, another this, another that. They've been fooling around with this for how long? I think what needs to happen is the state legislature and the governor go into a room, no coffee and donuts, and by the end of the month, have a figure, have a plan in place that's fair. Why does it have to go on and on and on? I'm a Randolph Township trustee. We don't run our township like that. We get something done, we get the facts, and we make a decision. I think you're right on that score. Something ought to be done, and it ought to be done to, and I'm telling you right now, whatever is done, there's going to be a number of people who are going to be unhappy with it. I understand. Period. No, that's number one. Number two is that I think, and again, I, forgive me, but I've not been in this as long as it's been going on, but my observation is sometimes, and I think the representative alluded to this earlier, we sometimes go from pillar to post. 
a plan gets put in place, somebody comes along and decides to tinker with it, and then two years later somebody tries to tinker with it, and we haven't seen the opportunity for some of these plans and some of these formulas that have been put in place to actually work for a long enough period of time to determine their efficacy. Now, I'm not suggesting to you, sir, that that's, that, that, that well, let's just try it again and see what happens. I, I, I agree that something needs to be done, but uh, I also believe that whatever it is that we accomplish in that respect is going to displease some, pe some people and it's going to please other people. But I know the governor is purposeful about trying to get it right and trying to get it right this time. We'll see what the budget looks like and what the formula that he's working on comes through. And I know with the good help of uh, people across the aisle, like, uh, like Representative Clyde, that good uh, people of good faith will give it their best shot to make it a system that, as you say, works for the most number of people. And I appreciate your frustration. I have a 90-year-old constituent that came to me over the weekend and said, I'm not going to vote for this. I'm not going to vote at all. It will be the third time in her life that she did not vote. She doesn't want to, she wants to, she has a great grandchild, she wants the education, but she can't afford, she's on fixed income and has no money. No money except from what Social Security is. So, does she go without meals on a couple days a week? Does she sell her house so she doesn't have to pay for it? There's something wrong with this system. Um, I wanted to know, um, Mr. Hurd, um, if the state does come in and takes over, what are we looking at as taxpayers on how much we're going to have to pay out of our pocket in case we don't decide to tax the Question is, how much will uh, you have to pay out of your pocket <laughs> if uh, there is a commission form that comes in and, and, and gives? First of all, it's called a financial planning and supervision commission. Okay, and that's important. It's not called the state coming in to take over commission. It's not called the state bringing a lot of money with them in commission. It's it's really no different than a financial planner or someone else who would help us as an individual. Only this commission comes in to try to work with the administration, the board of education. Every year, the auditor state's office will come in and will certify the deficit. So if you're showing a deficit of 1.46 million. You know, the, the auditor state will come in and certify that number, and then that would be the number that I would have to go to get solvency assistance for you. It also, uh, the auditor state's office will tell the commission how many mills of, of, of that, that it would take in order to, to get that, to raise that much money. Now again, I'll go back to the experience of what we had in Little Miami. They were shown at the point about $11.5 million deficit. The auditor state came back to our commission one day, and he said, well, if you get 12.95 mills, you know, you'll have, good, you'll, you'll have positive numbers for three years, and then you'll go back in deficit mode again. If you go 13.95 mills, you'll have positive numbers for five years of your forecast and have about a million dollars carryover. If you go 14.95 mills, you'll have uh, five years of positive numbers and about four million dollars to carry over. So they selected 13.95 mils because it would do the job. Okay, but so again, it, it would have to come down because the auditor state is the commission's um, uh, financial <coughs> advisor, so to speak, the same as the commission is for the district. Okay, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, so say we go ahead and we put on this levy ballot that we're trying to get 13.5 Okay, and it's going to be maybe fifteen dollars extra a month that we're going to have to pay towards our taxes. But if a state takeover comes in, and you said no matter what, if we keep going into deficit, at some point we're going to have to pay. That's we don't correct. get it say so. How much more are we going to have to pay each month to be able to do it? Well, maybe the auditor could help us out here, but again, that is going to depend on. What one mill would bring in, what the value of one mill is in, in your district, the valuation here, do um, you know that offhand? 5.9 mills is going to bring in like 936,000. Less than a million. Less than a million. 
it, it, it depends. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes into that. And how high is the deficit? And again, then you would have to determine, uh, you know, again, what the millage is and how many mills it would take to get out of that. Right. And the more money they borrow and the more money they pay back, yeah. the higher the millage will be in the end because that's a one-time thing you're borrowing. And it's like when we got all the stimulus money, they gave it to us, they threw it at the schools, and then they quit it. You take the rainy day fund, they give it to you for a couple years, and then they don't give it anymore, you've got a bigger problem. That's why you need stability of some kind, be it whatever, state or your local levies. It's about $158,000 roughly for, for each mill. So on that forecast, if you wanted to figure that out, go to that bottom line where it shows the deficit every year that passes, and then divide that number by that. No, that. Yeah. For our state to do this, like, what are we going to be putting on there? Like, how much do we need to be able to do? If we're going to look at maybe each month, maybe, what, $14 extra a month for our kids? I think on 100,000, that's 15, close to 6 months. You know, three months. That gives us out of five years of life. Okay, so that's still over five years. Yeah, so if we take and bite the bullet and just give the extra $14 each month and try and help our kids' education, instead of waiting until the state comes in and takes over, and continue and says, okay, you know what, fine, we're gonna slap it on there. You guys are paying maybe $30, $40 each month more instead of paying just $14, $15 each month. Is it better for us to have that money and just wait until the state comes in or just like you? Like the state comes How is that money paid back? Let's say we just uh, pull a number out we went three million dollars in the hole okay. it has to be paid back in two years how is that money collected um, that money the, the question is how is the money the solvency assistance that is provided to the district to meet their financial obligations for a year how is that repaid actually I set up the repayment schedule on that and it comes right out of the district's foundation now the, the, the way schools are funded in the state uh, the state obviously does not have the, the seven, the eight point billion dollars to give out all at one time. So they send it out twice a month through what's called the foundation. And the foundation is, again, as the tax money comes in, it doesn't all come in set or eight point seven billion dollars at a time. So it's given out the twice a month. And that foundation then it would be 24 payments uh, each year that would be withhold, withheld. So if you have to borrow $3 million, you're going to repay a million and a half back each of those two years. That money is, by the way, interest-free, but it's your own money. So if a commission is here and you're $3 million in deficit, they'll probably tell you to make some kind of reductions or raise new money in the tune of about $4.5 million because you're $3 million in debt plus a million and a half that you're going to be receiving less the next two years. <clears throat> It fixes the immediate problem, but the following year is really ugly. And we went through that. But what if we don't raise the money? You'll get solvency assistance again, a higher amount. And then you'll get a solvency assistance again for a higher amount until your deficit is high enough that you're going to have to pass one of these humongous levies to take care of. And no, we'll not. There's nothing that will allow a district to forfeit their charter for financial reasons. In fact, the statute says the opposite, that the district must keep their doors open due to financial reasons. No consolidation then? Well, that? consolidation, yes, is going to be a local issue. Now, we have one up in Geauga County right now that we're talking about. And they're talking about, I mean, matter of fact, there's, they've already hired attorneys. We have a meeting Friday. Oh, great. Go on to that. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get the job done. Mr. Hart, can you, can you speak to that for a moment? What, if a district wanted to look at consolidate, what does that process entail? Well, there is a list of uh, about 25 uh, questions that committees from uh, districts would have to go through. First of all, if you're wanting to consolidate, you have to have what I would call a cooperating partner. Okay? <laughs> 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 
have done this in the past uh, both districts have submitted a referendum issue on the ballot we want to create a commission to uh, go through this 20 list of 25 questions and again they talk about uh, racial bias they want to make sure that uh, there are enough um, chairs funds available to do it how it's all going to look what everybody's going to pay what millage you're going to pay because most likely you're going to pay the higher rate of each whichever district you're going to be consolidated with so those are the type of things that, that, that this commission would do now if both districts would agree to put that commission together then the commission would do it then they're out of business and then it comes back on a referendum ballot again for both districts to vote on to approve for that consolidation measure that's kind of it in a nutshell um, again as you can anticipate there's about a three-year legal wrangling on how to go about doing that and trying to answer all the questions for you so it's not anything that can be done overnight it's not something that will be done uh it's nothing that can be mandated to do for you at the department the legislature there's there's nothing in there that forces a district to do it it's it's all at the local level and again you and your cooperating partner dance partner whatever you want to call them um, get together and agree that this is what it's going to be we are having those discussions uh, again uh, this Friday we have our first one with um, uh, Madison local and Ledgemont again Ledgemont didn't want any didn't have any other local partners other than the one uh, right north of them it has to be a contiguous district little Miami we had those discussions I called all six superintendents from the districts around um, Little Miami, none of them wanted anything to do with them. No, they said, yeah, I can't get my people to, you know, to, to help us pass our own bills, you know, be able to pay our own bills, let alone if they ever thought that we're going to, you know, have to do, take on their uh, deficit, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. So. Yes, this question is to Mr. Hill. More meetings I've been to in the past, if you would pass this thing in February, I think he said the whole is over four or five. It's called a band-aid solution until the state decides how they're going to fund the school. Today in a conversation was talked about education is changing, and I think we're on the verge of it. What I mean by this, right up in front of you, you'll have one teacher in one location teaching four or five districts covering hundreds of third grade kids, fourth grade, where we're eliminating with this new technology. This school right now is wired for the next generation of kids coming through this thing. So I think everybody in this room, you know what technology did this Christmas on the iPads. We had a meeting the other night on cell phones and all that. It's starting right now and we're on the verge of it. It's right off the start of it. And I think you can see it, what's coming which eliminate a lot of jobs. You watched 60 Minutes last night on a robot system that eliminated hundreds of people's jobs, but also created jobs for that those kids that came out of college that's going to go into that field. The third grade kids we're having this school right now today, their jobs not even been invented yet. So we have new technology. So we can get through the six years with the band-aid situation what you're describing is called blended learning and i think roger talked about it earlier but don't kid yourself little kids the little ones especially yeah you can have somebody on a screen teaching them but you need somebody on site teaching them also that part's not going to go away mr hill i just want to congratulate you on the job that you got done uh, my question is, I know you're coming up with a fiscal year in the next year and a half, if there might be some things, but if the levy doesn't pass, as a parent, what kind of cuts or what are your intentions are to put us back more, you know, better program? 
Well, what are you looking at? Like more money being raised for sports? You know, yeah, so we're, so we're in a situation right now where we, our forecast, and we see it, shows us being able to get to the next year without having to do any additional cuts, which will be the first time in a while we haven't had a cash. Okay, once we get to the point, though, that we don't have this additional revenue, then the only thing left for us really to do is to cut to that state minimum. And like I mentioned earlier, we don't know, and Mr. Harden threw out a number up there, we don't think we have enough to cut to eliminate that deficit in fiscal year, fiscal year 15, where it shows up to 300 some thousand dollars. So we, we would cut this to a minimum. The only other area that could potentially potentially be an area where we could do something with income would be the, the uh, extracurricular activities, whether they're athletic or not. Right. The board has a pretty steep pay to participate cost right now. And I, and I think we've had numerous discussions at the board level about it. And I think there's a hesitancy for the reasons you heard Mr. Hardin and Mr. Stauffer talk about. If we were to flat out eliminate those, or raise the cost to the point where there no no revenue paid out for them. We're afraid that that's going to cause a mass exodus of students, and we're going to lose more money than we would have to lose other money. Would you, for for example, with that, we pay after everything is said and done. The things are free for this. We pay to participate in the game seats. We we spend about one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year as a district. So it wouldn't take us losing many students to offset that additional revenue we would raise through that. And so that's a concern, but on the flip side, we've also talked about how we worry that all of these cuts we've made in programming and personnel that are affecting the classroom, which is our primary focus, could cause that same mass exodus. So, then, um, would you also look at the possibility if it doesn't pass, and we run into that deficit, now, would you, without cutting the pay to play, would you look at the busing too? So, busing, that's a great question. And I believe busing was cut in Springfield. Yes. I'm not so, sure if that's correct yeah. or not. But but busing, busing was cut, and the same thing. It had a negative effect, and it was cut before I got there. I didn't, I wasn't responsible for that. They went to state minimum <coughs> busing, which uh, you don't have to bus high school students, and any kid uh, who's within, I think, two miles of the school, they don't get bused either. Uh, what we saw, though, is we had old facilities, we were doing pay-to-play, we had cut busing, and we are in fiscal emergency. We weren't real attractive. Uh, <laughs> anybody who comes to us or kids to stay there. Uh, if I'm a parent, and I'm going to have to transport my kid anyways, why not take them to a new building or a, uh, a district around us that has new facilities if I'm going to have to transport them anyway? And, and that's great, and, I, and I'll tell you, in our, in our situation here, this is a good example of where you can't just take and replicate something from one place to the other. You can study them, you can take a look and get ideas. So when we made this change in transportation, it's almost been two full years now, where we went from two bus routes to one. We laid out to the boards, I think it was four different scenarios, one of which was cut to state minimum transportation. But when we looked at that and we talked to the transportation department at the Ohio Department of Education, they told us, they gave us our reimbursement amounts for what we get for transporting pupils. And at that time, if our board would have cut the state minimum, we would have actually lost $80,000 compared to the move we made to go one bus route K-12. So we are actually maximizing not only the, you know how we transport or we're maximizing the dollar amount because anything else we do if we were to cut the state minimum the only reason i could ever see us doing that is just out of pure spite and inconvenience people yeah. because because there's no financial savings there at all for us it's a loss and so but you know not many districts in the state i would guess could say that it just happens to be for us because of our size that that worked for us. And you know, the other one that we hear a lot of is our cafeteria program, just eliminate lunches. And our cafeteria program operates in black every year. You know, there and we've you know we had to increase our lunch costs not because we're losing money, but because there's a federal mandate in place that you have to get so close to the reimbursement of dollar amount, you have to increase it every year until you're there. 
So that's another area where it's self-sustaining. It's bringing, yeah, it's bringing money, and there's nothing that we can do there. But those are two that we constantly hear about, and they're they're not going to make an impact when it comes to this. No. And, and one thing further, Andy, on that is that we haven't mentioned yet the safety for the kids. Well, absolutely. You know, there is not so, there there are no sidewalks on these roads out here. I've driven them already. <laughs> sidewalks. <there. laughs> so where are they going to walk? I can tell you, I, I have three children. I moved into the Randolph area coming from Field. It's been almost two years now. I was not happy with Field because my kids did not do well as far as grade goes. Before that, we were at Kent, and I was not as pleased with that, but we had to move for other reasons. When we landed one driveway inside Waterloo, and it was open enrollment, and there was no busing to get my kids, two of them, to field, and I've got a third one coming up, I was nothing but elated when I called the school and found out that they all kids went the same hours, the same day, and there was one bus, everybody got on it, because that meant my then 15-year-old could help my first grader on the bus, get her off the bus, it made it so much easier, and that as a parent is a relief, especially if you're a single parent. Now, <coughs> if busing works well, which I'm glad to hear you say that that's not, that's not, not that it's not going to happen, but it's far off to that. Because I have a third child coming up in the Dow Water Center that you guys put in daycare. Is there any room to look at, does that bring in revenue? Does that, can you do more with that? So I mean, you're talking the storage yeah. learning center that's here. Yeah, so mean, some of the things that some system. of the things that the district has done over the last two years has been to try to rent out any available space that we have. So uh, two years ago we brought back the special education programs for students with disabilities to our district, and we get a uh, monthly. Um, rate from the county for housing and units here. And then this year we moved the portal we came to agreement with portable <coughs> learning centers in here. They have I think three different programs that run a head start and two types of preschools plus before and after school. So we're leasing space to them. We are pretty much during the school day, I think we the principals could probably say it's better than me, but I think we are leased out as far as space goes uh, during during the school day. But we try to find these non-traditional ways to generate to generate more money. But the problem here is, you know, we've been able to put off, you know, those of you that were here last year and heard Mr. Harden speak, this picture looked a lot worse last year and he alluded to that earlier than it does than it does right now. It's a lot sooner. Yeah, you know, we've had some fortunate things happen with insurance changes, with uh, rate rate increases that didn't happen anywhere near the amount that the consortium expert consultant predicted they would. And when, when that's happened, this board has stepped back, pulled the levy off the ballot to reassess what amount to go for because they realize that the smaller the amount is, the more likely this will pass and we're trying to get out for a certain period of time. The, the thing I'm here for personally is, I think we've about run out of every rabbit in the hat. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't, you know, we, we had 24% building for insurance rates and it came in at 1.3. Shockingly, last year. That saved a lot of money to push this down the road here. Is that ever going to happen again? Probably not in my lifetime. Because that just, it just can't, you can't, you, it, it just won't. And so we're, we're about out of options. And what I'm hearing here tonight, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing here tonight is, look, this is a local decision on what level of education you want. If you want state minimum, fine. But at some point, you don't have money to even fund state minimum. There's nothing in the Ohio Revised Code that allows a district to dissolve. So either you find a district willing to take you on and take it to the voters for consolidation in both districts, or you continue on in a state of bare minimum until you pass a levy that eventually gets you out of it. Is that, is that pretty much correct? Sums it up very quite nice. And, and in most of these cases, you've heard of Little Miami, there's one closer to us, East Canton back in the, 
back in 97, it passed, it was a 12 point, I got it here. They started off, we just got this today, and they had requested this. They were passed, so November, here you go. On November the 7th, 1995, they failed, a, they failed one that was like five. November 5th, 96, they passed, or they failed one that was 17. They finally passed one in 97 that was 12 and a half. So they went from asking for something that was about five all the way up to 17 and settled at 12. You have Little Miami that passed 13.95. And my guess is of those 38 that you talked about being in fiscal emergency since 1996 when this came in inception in the state, do you have any idea roughly the percentage of those that got out of it by passing <coughs> as opposed to those that- I've worked with two years. districts, you know, and, and, and since I've been in the Department of Education in this role, I've worked with two districts that have not passed new money. One was Springfield, Rolfo, and the other was uh, Trimble down in Athens County. But there's a variety of reasons in each of those. Uh, in this case, it was just a, a fact of being um, overstaffed. Uh, Trimble, uh, Trimble down in Athens County, the poorest school district in the state, they were getting so much money in um, state aid at the time that they had to pass a lot of additional millage to even get to the point where they were going to count for new money. So, you know, that's a, a no-brainer. You couldn't ask your, uh, your constituents to say, well, if you pass eight mills, we'll get uh, two mills worth of new money because the rest of it is just paying back what the state's already given us. I didn't run away. I want to make sure I'm getting all any hands in the back. Go ahead. When you say overstaffed, what does that mean? We have, we have too many teachers. I get that, but like for your for your instance, like what was overstaffed? What specific yeah. classes, grades? Mm -hmm. Specific classes, grades. It was, a, it was across the board. It was 82 teachers. We ended up reducing. The first thing that happened when uh, the state came in, they did a staff analysis, and they told us in each area exactly how many, how many, too many, how too many teachers that we had. So that's what social studies. We had five too many. They said get rid of five social studies. And, and that's what we've done here in this district as well too. It says that there were six and a half above minimum operating level. Okay, so really there's gonna, now there's more kids in the classroom already. Where those, these teachers here are excellent. They've done a great job. I can't say anything more about the elementary. I've only gone elementary and now junior high. And I love that. But I can tell the difference as far as you having all these kids in this classroom so when you say you're cutting like, for example, say it's a third grade class and they only have like two social studies, I mean how many, where do you go? Like for instance, using water, where would you cut another, where would you cut another staff member? Because I feel like we don't have our man as it is. So what would you do? Well, those, those would mostly be the electives that I would have. Okay, like. Because the way that these, the way that, without, without getting into details that it just for everybody. The way that the state calculates the state minimums go by the grade level. So you have to have a K, you, K through 4, you have to have a ratio of 25 to 1. K through 12, you have to have that same ratio. But you heard before these ESPs, these personnel, K through 8 is what they consider, the state considers elementary, and then that's where pretty much the special classes fall, guidance counselors, all of that, art, music, theme. But at the high school level, that's not included in that ESP number, that's included in the <coughs> teachers. So when you do these tests, it's not that anybody thinks that those things are less valuable, it's just the cuts have to come from somewhere, and, and most of the time that's where they come from. So, for us, that six and a half, seven and a half, whatever that number is, okay, those would mostly come from electives at the higher levels where we could. And if there's anything left to cut with electives at the grade levels, and then the rest of that would come from wherever it's showing, wherever staff, for example, to, and then as you go from staff in the sense of minimum, that there's two, two core teachers paid for four we could reduce and still be in a 25 to 1 ratio. And that, but that, again, that's all the saving, as far as I'm concerned, Bill can chime in this if he wants. When you actually say a 25 to 1 ratio, 
the numbers in the classroom are not 25 to 1. The numbers in the classroom, you're looking at mid to high 30s. Well, it's a bad reader, like the Title I one's a whole different ball game that that falls into federal funding, and right now this clip issue hasn't been finalized. And there could be so special ed and Title One. I mean, maybe this is a completely different dialogue than this. This doesn't show up out here at all. But we may be looking at a 14 percent cut for next school year in those areas in addition to this problem. One of the things that happened at Springfield when I said that you still had to follow the negotiated agreement that you had with teachers. Um, one of the items, though, that we did not have to follow in our negotiated agreement, uh, there are class size limits. We didn't have to follow those, so class sizes did go up and they got kind of high. Uh, that's one of the things that would probably happen once a year. Almost 30. You want to do this? <laughs> Maybe you're already there. Just where did that go? That's that's certainly not ideal, especially with the uh, little ones. I just had a comment and kind of a question. Um, I graduated from here 20 years ago, and I'm moving back here. I hope um, I bought five acres in Randolph. Um, I don't know if there's any teachers in here now because I don't I don't recognize any teachers. I am a government employee for the city of Akron. And I know I, I get com I hear comments from a lot of people because government employees and I'm gonna rack teachers in with it. We make too much money. You guys are making eighty thousand dollars a year. I don't make eighty thousand dollars a year. I've been there sixteen years. Roundabout numbers, I make about forty five thousand dollars. I've got a college education. I know the teachers that my kids go to Akron Public Schools. They're in one of the best school districts, school areas in there right now. They do an awesome job. I'm not really dissatisfied with what's going on, but I wanted to move out into the, back into the country where I grew up. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that I've talked to some people in there about, that, uh, and, I'm, and that's why I'm at telling you, and I think this is probably, nobody's brought it up yet, but why not go to your teachers, go to the staffing, you know, the papers are very biased on what they print, and, and they don't want to tell the truth on everything. I would rather see what your teachers make, because comments are, are made for me, because I'm a government employee, you make too much money. Show what these teachers make. Show what they, their salaries are. Show what their benefits are. Because we're not getting rich being a teacher. We're not getting rich being a public employee. He's, he's a Randolph Township person. He's not getting rich doing it. You know, show the public what these teachers are doing, and they're rated excellent. That's why I'm moving back here, because I've been following what Waterloo is, and I want to bring my kids back out here to graduate from here. You I know. just wanted to speak to that real quick. I'm, I'm a teacher here, and um, we receive a newsletter at the beginning of each year that shows um, how much we make in comparison to other districts in Portage and Summit County. Um, at the beginning of this year, we received our newsletter, and out of the 24 districts in Portage and Summit County, um, we are the lowest paid teachers. Um, so just so you know, we're not stealing your tax money. <laughs> we're not. Yeah, but the, the problem is with that is there's 1,200 kids here or whatever. There ain't no 1,200 parents sitting here. And there, there's more members in this community that aren't sitting here that they're ignorant and they don't want to pay attention or they, they don't want to read. Um, you know what? Take some of that money and mail it out to the to the how many how many I don't know how many people live out here now ten thousand people between the two communities. Mail one to every single pe person so they get it in black and white and say this is what your teachers are making this is what their benefits are this is what they gave up so everybody knows. But there are people who don't want to see that. A majority of the people don't want to see what's in black and white. But a lot of people don't get the newspaper. A lot of people. These, the older generation don't use computers. My parents don't use computers, so they don't read that. I'm saying you put it on a piece of paper and mail it to them. Fine, if they choose to throw it away, that's fine. But at least you've gotten so many more people educated on, you know what? 
for him example, there's probably people thinking, I don't know how long he's been teaching or whatever, but I guarantee you there's people saying that he's making sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars. And I doubt that he's making that. <laughs> I doubt that he's making that. Thirty seconds, maybe I can help this out. This again is from the benchmark report, but this comes out from fiscal year eleven. The average teacher salary in Waterloo is fifty-one thousand seven hundred forty-three dollars, and that's based on twelve point seven years of, of experience. It doesn't say anything about master's degree or none of that. Uh, the average in the district, uh, the average teacher makes fifty-seven thousand. Were made this in, in fiscal year eleven. $57,801 with 14.7 years experience. So the same here is a little bit less experience than they are in the county. That was the county. Uh, in the state, the state level is 57,893 at 14.6. So they're very similar to what the county is. Uh, the state and county are very similar. And again, water is much less than that based on their less lower uh, number of years teaching. Now, if you want to go to really make some money, go to uh, uh, Springfield. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, they're, they're, you know, I, I don't understand what you have, your statistics there and whatever, but I'm telling you, there's people that, that just take a conception of government employees and teachers make thousands and thousands of dollars, so why should we vote another levy to pay, make, pay their salary? And it's not true. People don't find the facts out. Well, so if you give yeah, facts. There's, a, there's another fact that I would like to see, and reference what he's talking about, is how much union dues does the teachers pay, and what benefits do they get from their union? Do they have to pay their health insurance? And how much is that per month? What's <coughs> hidden factor in this whole agenda? Yes, sir. The, the, this is a question for the, the panel, more of a process side, but the, the members of the board that are here, it, uh, the one thing that I have not heard at all tonight and not heard at a board meeting or, or in any context in, in any earnest sense is a school district income tax as a viable alternative option to uh, at the levy. Can the board speak to why or why not we've not seen it on the ballot and then it, for some of the people that don't understand it, if the, the panel could talk about the process a bit. So, we got the exact number. So, so when we, so two, when we failed the, um, when we failed the level in November of 2010, we kicked off this tour of forums in the first couple of bills of finances, and before the board made a decision on what to put on the May 11th ballot, they held a number of forums where community could come and listen to the options that the Ohio Revised Code allows and give input on what they thought may work for this community. And so we listened, didn't really, there really wasn't, you know, and so what are those options? It's a traditional property tax levy like we're talking about. And I think for rental millage, you can increase it by certain amounts, which was mills or dollars each year. There's emergency levies, there's firm income tax, and then there's a, a traditional <coughs> income tax. And we were, we were quite honestly most interested in for an income tax. We didn't get strong feedback on that, so we, we reduced the millage almost half after we did all these cuts, put it forth to the voters, and I, I believe that that one was also for five years instead of a continuum. And um, it failed just as bad on those. We took then the data, we, Todd, our treasurer, took the data from the Board of Elections from November of 2010 and May of 2011. We made some educated guesses, I would say, so it's not hard science, but we were trying to take a look at who's actually voting. So when we did that, both times, and there was a significant difference in the amount of people that showed up to vote, because November of 10 was the governor race, and May of 11 was just a primary. But both times, people aged 65 to 100, those that we assume are on a fixed income, the ones that supposedly are failing our levies left and right, they, they accounted for 22% of the people that voted. Even if they would all have voted yes, yeah, we don't know how they voted, but let's assume all of, every one of them voted yes, it still wasn't enough to pass either of those elections for us. On the flip end, 18 to 30 year olds accounted for 7% of 
both times. So 71% of our voters that are showing up to actually cast a vote are the ages of 31 to 64, and we made assumptions that those are people that are out there working. And when you get into like an earned income tax, those are the people, by and large, that shoulder a much larger heavy burden for that same dollar amount that the property tax brings in. So we use that information to stay away from it. But if it, being devil's advocate, because I don't have the hard numbers, wouldn't wouldn't it be prudent of the of the board just to float it as an option? If it fails, it fails. You're in the same boat you're in right now. Possibly. I mean, if you're just taking the dabs in the dark on turnout, maybe you can float. You can float anything. I think what the board is trying to do is take the facts that they have and put forth what they feel is the best chance of something being successful. And based off of those numbers, uh, I don't think anybody on the board, nor myself, or the treasurer, felt that we would stand a chance at all to do something like that. Could, could the board and, and the two of us be wrong? Sure. <coughs> but, but we'd be asking those people that are turning out and voting heavily to support something that's going to raise their taxes even more. And, and right now, they, that group, that bulk, has to be a large number of people that are not supporting us with these smaller requests. Why are they going to support us with something larger? That was the rationale. Now, are we right or not? I don't know. But that's why we stayed away from it. And I, Lisa, Ken, yeah. Steve, Diane, anybody wants to jump in, Todd, feel free. Didn't that go down in flames and feel? Big time. We got flushed. Well, it's the same thing also with uh, what Roger Cook said back here. When we're not unsympathetic to the fact that people are hurting, people don't have the money, we don't want people to starve to, to support us. But at the same time, um, from what Mr. Harden said, if we continue on this route, it's better to pay $15 a month than to pay $30, $45 a month. And you know we're we're stuck because the state, as they said, we can't count on them. So we're stuck having to handle this short term and trying to educate our kids. So at this point, in my opinion, if you can pay fifteen, if I can pay fifteen dollars more a month instead of paying forty five dollars more a month because they're but they lend us money, I'd rather pay fifteen dollars a month. And we have cut everywhere, and we you know the state has cut also. So that's why whenever we say about the third grade reading guarantee, yes, we, we budgeted here, and then they added the third grade reading guarantee, which is a good thing, but they didn't give us any money to cover. So we have to take our, it's like having $1,000 a month and budgeting $1,000 a month. And then someone comes up and says, okay, well, that's good, but we're only going to give you $750 a month this month. Well, what are you going to do? It's not because you overspent, it's because you planned on that, because that's what you thought you were getting. So now you're getting less. So we have to, that's where we make the best, and that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, we've been, we've been working at it for a long time now. And, uh, I have a question, way in the back. Yep. Is there a website or a place you can go to find out what the uh, cost of living is in the city of Bellevue? Yeah, there's a place called Bellevue Housing Finance. Yeah. Uh, it's on Bellevue Housing Finance. Yeah. 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 Right. I've got a card here that tells our internet website. Search the <coughs> property records on our main website, and you can put in a calculation, and it'll tell you exactly what you'd be paying at the current yes. effective tax rate. And they can do that for surrounding areas in our county, too? Yeah. To see you can, the the same question was, how much are we paying compared with the other townships? In the well, town. we published the effective tax rate, so they'll come up. But obviously, if you correlate the fact that we have the lowest paid people, do we have the lowest tax rates, too? I no, I think we, field's I lowest, but you guys are right in there for windows. I don't know if they were last month. the highest. Great Lake, Kent's well, highest, Aurora, Streetsboro. Well, and then well, you're down the line out of 12 districts. But you can go in and see the effective tax rates, they're online. I, I'll give you an example real quick of what I pay in the city of Akron. Half acre lot, 1,300 square foot house, 
It's valued at 113000 roughly, because I'm trying to sell it. I pay $2,600 a year. Yeah, but so, what school district are you in? And what I mean, that, it doesn't matter. Compare, compare to what? Because there's effective tax rates and voted... No, 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 wait. I'm talking value to value. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't? No, My it parents doesn't live out here, have eight, 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 eight acres, a house the same size as mine, and they pay the same amount that I have. I have a house. It's because their tax rates are different than yours. I'm giving them a value. I'm right. giving them a value of what... He's asking what he pay, would pay on, what'd you say, 200000 or whatever? Tell him to come in and visit me and I'll walk him through it and show him all the different rates in the county. I can take one more question. We've got a couple of reps that do have to hit the road. In the back row here. Thank you. Um, Senator Rossland, you know, one thing I hope you take back with you is that when your colleagues talk about the schools, need to do more with less or they aren't getting any more money they need to see how they can be more efficient more effective one thing you take back to your colleagues I, I hope is that these are not anonymous school districts what you see tonight these are real people kudos to dr hill and the school board, school board and the faculty and staff that make us you've seen they look at every angle of everything they can possibly do and that's what schools are doing so take that back and that i don't know how they can be more efficient or more effective um so i hope you take that back with you, but also I'm hoping you could address um, what I'm looking for me to. And, and Mr. Stauffer, the new core standards, how are you meeting those? Uh, no one's getting any more money, and you had indicated earlier in the program that they're going to be really hard to meet without new people. Yeah. Uh, one of the fortunate things that we have is we're going to move into a, a brand new junior high high school next year. We're going to be able to share staff, so we're going to be more efficient that way. Uh, right now, we have a separate junior high and a separate high school with uh, staff of high school teachers, staff of junior high teachers. We're bringing them together. Uh, they will be able to share uh, courses that are taught. That's how we're going to do it. Um, one of the comments I'd like to make is uh, one of the things that I've been impressed with tonight is you people are efficient here, Andy. Uh, you guys were projecting a deficit just a year ago. Uh, you've turned that around. I know somebody at the, one of the first questions was, uh, what districts can we go to to see efficiencies? I think you're seeing them right here. Um, you should be proud of the district that you have and the achievement that your kids have. Uh, I know people always say, well, people who come to this meeting are positive people and you're preaching to the choir. That, that's okay, because you need to go out and talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, and tell them that they do need to vote yes on this levy in February to save your schools. You have a great thing going here. Uh, do what's right for the kids here. They deserve it. They're your future. One last comment. Waterloo Community Action Committee does team up with the Levy Committee here at Waterloo. There is a website out there, wearewaterloo.org, that lists several of the cuts we've already made at the district. It lists information on our district. It'll also give you a direct link to Janet's site to plug in your personal home information value. It'll calculate that for you. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that if you have not. Janet has a quick comment. If you own your own home and live in it, you're entitled to two and a half percent discount in your taxes. To get that, you have to sign up for it. Owner occupied. If you're 65 or over, or on 100% disability, you can save three to four hundred dollars or more in taxes, and that's all reimbursed back to your school. Okay, so nobody loses. Do these programs. Call my office. Call me. Go on the internet. It's a good program. I thank our representatives. I thank each of you. If you have questions, we'll be here after. Thank you. Have a great evening. Next meeting. Next board meeting. Call the next board meeting. Oh, yeah. It's February 14th. Sorry. That's all right.